Gentlemen, welcome to the Darkstone Dossiers with your host, Anthony Darkstone. Buonasera, buenas noches, buon noit, and a very good evening, good morning, or good afternoon, depending on where you're watching this on the planet. Why am I using all these languages? It's because we do have people from all over the world who not only attend these shows, but are actually members of the Society of American Magicians. And contrary to popular belief, you don't have to be an American to be a member of the Society of American Magicians. So it just seems a nice way of greeting a few people in a few different languages. And while we're in the subject of greeting, I would like very, very much, in fact, to acknowledge the presence of a fine gentleman that I've known for many, many years, uh, who is very fondly thought of by many people in England, who was instrumental in many major stars getting their start uh, including my son as well. And this gentleman is an MIMC with a gold star at the Magic Circle. And I am personally delighted to welcome him. And that is Mr. Keith Churcher. So I'm very, very glad to have him here. Also, uh, it would be remiss of me if I didn't acknowledge members of our International Assembly, uh, such as who, uh, Elmo Huvila from Finland, Donna Horn, and uh, Harriet Jacobson, of course, and a number of people from our assembly. Nice to see a wonderful gentleman also from Canada, Ariel Frelick. And Canada is where my guest comes from, who is a member of the SAM and the International Assembly. See, he's not an American. And I will also introduce you to one or two, uh, three of our officers for the SAM. And one of them is also Canadian. So there you go. So, ladies and gentlemen, before we get on with the show proper, let me just very quickly introduce you to most illustrious Dr. Joel Zaritsky, who is the president of the Society of American Magicians, who would want to say a few words of welcome, I'm sure. Hey, everybody. I'm so happy you're here on a Saturday afternoon. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm just doing stuff backstage here, so I'm just hanging out, enjoying the show like you all. So thanks for being here. I would also like to ask our president-elect of the SAM, Mr. Tom Gentile, to also say a few words of welcome, if you'd be so kind, Tom. I want to thank everyone for coming out this afternoon. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful way to spend some time in a great hobby with great people and see great talent. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr. President-elect Tom Gentile. I would now like to move very quickly to um, another Canadian gentleman who happens to be also a member of our International Assembly and a few other assemblies in the SAM. Um, and he's from Canada and he is our first vice president. So, Mr. Rod Chow. Thank you, Anthony. Hello, everyone. And I'd um, like to give a welcome, welcome from Canada and really great to see a fellow Canadian, my friend, Dr. Mike Leike, being featured on this program. And it's going to be very exciting. And also, I want to wish all of you a happy Chinese New Year of the Ox, which is uh, this weekend. Uh, happy Valentine's Day this weekend. And in Canada, we also have a family day. So it's actually a long weekend for us. On Monday is family day. So happy long weekend from Canada. Thank you very much, Rod. Um, I'm a little bit saddened that you haven't brought red envelopes for everybody. <laughs> no, Rod, Rod, Rod is a very cool guy. Yeah, I'm married for that. That's young and I'm married in your yard. <laughs> it, it, really, it, really, it really is. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, now that we've made the introductions, all we to tell you is that towards the end of the show, we have a meet and greet, which most illustrious, which is how we address our president, by the way, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, calls it uh, schmooze and something. 
I just call it meet and greet. Uh, there it is. He's got it up on the screen. Smooths and smooths. Yeah. Then we just chat. We open up the chat and everybody talks to the guests and hopefully to each other. And you know, that's really what it's all about. It's just fun. It's just friendly. So without much further ado, or as my friend uh, Scott Wells often says, we need more ado. <laughs> Let me introduce you uh, very briefly to my guest. But before we go to him, I want to tell you a little bit about him. He is, as I've mentioned already, from Canada. He is a member of the SAM International Assembly. He is an author. He has three doctorates. I'm not sure I know, a, I know a couple of magicians who have doctorates and different things, but he actually has three, which I'm sure he'll be telling us about in a little while. He's written some books and he has a wealth of experience in producing and directing his own shows. He also actually continues to do that during this lockdown phase by interviewing uh, various magicians from around the world. But we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. But before we do, as is customary on this show, we always run a little clip of just a small snippet of what the guest has done by the way of performance. This particular performance I like personally. Let me explain. Michael is a member of the SAM and the IBM, and he's always wanted to join the Magic Circle, which we spoke about, and both myself and uh, most illustrious Dr. Joel Zaritsky uh, sponsored him, and obviously he went through the stages and phases, and the last one for, was for him to perform, as everybody has to, an examination to be given an MMC, which is Member of the Magic Circle, which those of you who are members of the Magic Circle, like myself and, and, and Joel and Rod, um, will know a little bit more about that. So I thought it would be only fitting that we show you a little clip of Michael's skills as a performer and what got him a glowing pass mark at the Magic Circle. So when we're ready, let's just run a little clip of Michael.
Wow. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to my guest, Dr. Michael Magic Mike Likey. Hello, Michael. How are you, Anthony? I'm really, really, really good. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to this because some of the things we're going to talk about are really dear to my heart, both personally and professionally. So it's great to have you here. Michael, let's just start. I know a lot of people with, with doctorates, but you have three Tell everybody a little bit about your three doctorates, how they arrived, what they're in, and how that pertains to your magic, if you would, please. Essentially, they're all in metaphysics. I achieved them mostly through the University of Sedona in the U.S., and I wasn't satisfied to just earn the one. It took me a couple of years to earn the one. The first one was a doctor of divinity, which enabled me to hold Sunday morning meetings, non-denominational, and... Uh, I wasn't content enough with that. I was content enough to see progress in um, people coming to the Sunday morning meetings and they had issues and whatever. And I was also a clinical hypnotherapist at the time. So uh, we, we would do stuff in, in the meetings as well. So I approached uh, the university for another doctorate, which essentially is in mystical research and did a study of um, hundreds of people in the meditative state. I wanted to see a correlation between meditation and self-hypnosis, if you will, and uh, achieved that uh, after a couple of years, and then went for the hardest one. It was the most gratifying one, a doctor of theocentric psychology, and that was hard. That was five volumes of 25 chapters, each book this uh, this thick and I'm, I'm most proud of that uh, as far as scholastic achievements are concerned because it sort of brought everything together which actually we're going to chat about shortly I'm sure that of some sort of not divine being because that reeks of religion which I'm not necessarily into more spirituality that non-physical thing that brings us all together that brings if you will the universe together and the real magic of life, which I believe I, I rediscovered this year while going th um, into my uh, magic circle exam. Uh, that's a whole journey in itself. And uh, hopefully we'll chat about that. I believe I rediscovered the meaning for me anyway, because it's different for everybody. What true joy is, what true magic, if you will, is in life. You're right. It's not just in the performance, although that gives us it. It's if you like the mindset of what makes us an average, slightly higher than average, good or a great magician. I mean, you know, everybody slots themselves wherever they wish. When you this word metaphysics sometimes has a kind of connotation that people go, oh, you know, voodoo and dark arts. Well, it can be, but I don't think that's what you and I refer to, or indeed, uh, Jeff McBride, when he talks about metaphysics, when he talks about sorcery, and the need to understand that before you can convey, for want of a better word, the energy of performance. What are your thoughts on that, Michael? Um, well, in, in my definition, and probably our definition of metaphysics, meta meaning more than, more than the physical. So it applies to anything that other than or in addition to the physical. And it all boils down to energy. And we either feel good or we feel bad or we feel whatever in between. And for me, tying together a little bit metaphysics with magic, performance magic as opposed to ritual magic, which... which uh, is a whole other thing. It's the excitement. It's the joy. Um, for me as a child, it was watching Disney cartoons and Saturday morning cartoons and drawing. I was also an artist, professional cartoonist and animator for many years. So that brought joy and excitement, if you will. It, it sort of raised my energy to more than joy. I, I felt the feeling of uh, being ecstatic, uh, if you will. So for me, the term metaphysics does not necessarily include the esoteric um, um, forms of divination and all that sort of thing, which one can include in all that. It's more than the physical. It's to do with energy. And that led me into, um, I, I worked for a number of years for a few new age shops 
in the uh, Vancouver, Canada area and discovered a lot of hmm, not such great things going on there, which is why I belong to the Paranormal uh, Investigative Committee of the SAM. And, but I did find some truths in there, some quote unquote legitimate things, again, to do with energy and a thing called Reiki. This is actually how I got into um, martial arts, if you will. Um, and Reiki uh, the, is the Japanese term uh, Ling Chi is the Chinese term. And there's a theory, which actually I believe has proven to be true. If you're into martial arts, in my opinion, more than 20 years, your Ling Chi comes out, it gets developed. Um, in New Age, they call it Reiki. It's also a legitimate Japanese word. And you become a healer of sorts. Now, I don't believe that anyone can heal anyone else. Perhaps we can touch something within them. The healing properties contained within everybody uh, so perhaps through performance of magic or watching a, a play or move either joyously or emotionally in some way. And that creates a catalyst for healing. Much the same with Reiki and Ling Chi. And then I discovered the rather than the New Age correlation, I, I did three years of research because I did not like the New Age correlation to Reiki. Uh, I believe there was something more. I read all the, the, the stories about Reiki and I just didn't sit right. right with me. And I found the origins. I even went to Buddhism, Tibetan Buddhism, Zen Buddhism, all this sort of thing. And I found the answer in Taoism or Taoism, if you will, mm. and those philosophies, not even so much Buddhism, but, but Taoism. People still believe, New Agers still believe there's a correlation between Buddhism and Reiki. There really isn't. It's more Taoism. And in Taoism, that opens up a whole door for growth energetically, physically, emotionally by doing the exercises, Tai Chi, Qigong, Kung Fu or Gong Fu, if you will. That will increase your emotional, physical stability, balance. And it's a whole world. And from that was born the energies of Ling Chi or Reiki, if you will, in, in the Japanese. Absolutely. I mean, you know, you, you and I have, have, have spoken about this uh, several times in the past. And this is why I said I would love to talk about this on the show, because those of us who are martial artists or, or Taoist, Taoist spelled T-A-O, but pronounced the Tao, understand these things. And I felt maybe perhaps some of the audience might like to just think about this and be, maybe be a little bit stimulated. We hear a lot about scripting. We hear a lot about performance techniques. And why not? These, I think, as you and I have spoken several times, are incorporating the performance techniques. As you mentioned, Chinese qi, Japanese qi, and of course, in uh, ancient Sanskrit and in the Hindu and yogis, etc., it's prana. There's this kind of internal energy. And you Jog my memory on something that dear John Rockabarmer once said. I was writing an article about him, and he said, look, the whole purpose of magic, and I didn't say this, he did. Um, the whole purpose of magic is to take this energy, this love that you feel, and convey that to whoever's watching you, be it you know, in a television studio or a 3,000-seated theater, or even one-to-one, -one, or a close-up table, or a restaurant table. And that struck me, and I thought, wow. You've summarized all of what we as performers should do. Now, I know you've written a book about that. You very kindly asked me to, to, to put a few words together as a foreword, which when I read the book, I thought, wow, how on earth do I do this? Uh, because it's, it's really quite staggering. And we'll, we'll, we'll get to that in a little bit, little bit time. But what I want to do is just touch, if I may, a bit on your history. Like all of us at one time, we were young men. And I think we have a picture of you as a young Michael. Uh -oh. There you are. Uh oh. <laughs> you know, we, didn't we all do that? You know. <laughs> yeah. But you know what? It was it was right at the time. You know, we uh -oh. had we had the long hair. I've I've grown mine since, as you can see. But uh, you no, know, we've had the long hair, and we did all that because those were the times. That, you know, pe people who are of our age and maybe slightly older or slightly younger would get that. Uh, 60s and 70s and some of the younger younger folks kind of go yeah i kind of saw that and I saw my grandfather my dad doing it you know so that's fine uh, but that was the embryo if you like that developed because that embryo went on to run magic shops run workshops give lectures i lost track of all the television shows that you've produced and done 
and the characters that you played. So fill us all in on some of those and what were they called? I think one was Castle of Magic. Am I, am I right? Magic Mike's Castle. A lot of Magic folks... Mike's Castle. I think we have a still of that someplace. Uh-oh. I'm almost sure we do. <laughs> yes, yes. That, that, that most illustrious will pull that up. I think there we are. Yes. Well, that, that's uh, that's a curtain. Been, that's you obviously had a ha- you obviously had a haircut since that first picture. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so there right. you are. What now? What was Castle of Mysteries? And then you did kids shows and did, did share with us some of that joy and the excitement of I will. together. I will. The the previous photo that you showed. Um, the costume, if you will, was inspired by a series in England called Robin of Sherwood, starring Michael Prade. There, there's a picture of um, 1990, circa 1990, my TV show backstage. And uh, the same sort of costume was inspired by this sort of pagan Robin Hood that was depicted in the series. It aired in Canada on CBC as um, Robin Hood. And something about it touched something within me. Up until that point, I was performing with a tuxedo and a red or black bow tie and kind of the cliche stereotypical magician. And then as soon as I began feeling this TV series with music by Clanad, uh, an Irish group, I believe they're still around. One of the sisters is Enya. And it moved something within me. And that's all I can say. I started to grow my hair longer like Michael Prayed. I sewed myself a costume very similar to Michael Prade's costume. And I was in my power. The first time I brought it out was at a mall show done, I think it was Magic Week, October 31st week, probably 1989. And all the other magicians who were my peers, they kind of, they looked, they, they didn't come up to me and comment, but I could see in their faces, who's this freak they're thinking. But me, in my head, I'm being me. I'm, I'm powerful. I feel so good. And it's the first time I actually used music for three tricks. I always used music for one trick. And it was clanet. It was a, a mystical kind of thing. And that show went on to become Magic Mike's Castle. Previous to that, I was doing a show for three years called Kitty Cabaret, where I was like a ringmaster kind of magician. My TV shows always reflected who I am or was at the time, or who I believed I am or was. So Magic Mike's Castle, in my opinion, hopefully in the opinion of a lot of people, 40, 50 plus, will agree they loved it. I still get comments when I go to book signings back in Winnipeg, Canada, from people who attend, they go, you're Magic Mike, I remember that guy, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and, and that means a lot to me. It, it was a mirror of one of my facets, one of the aspects of who I am. The, the show right after that, a few years later, which ran for another couple of years, Magic Mike and Company, and I was trying to essentially be another magician. I wasn't being myself. Fortunately, things were wrapping up anyway. It lasted two, maybe three seasons. But I dressed in regular clothing that was kind of popular at the time. And I didn't feel like it was a success. I had cut my hair. People liked it. But for me, I wasn't being me totally. So was it art imitating life, life imitating art? (laughs) I don't know. But that's where I, I latched onto the whole mystical thing. I'd been meditating already for a number of years. So I was kind of in a groove, if you will, of something something greater and I would always sit in my car and meditate right before doing a series of live shows my agents were very kind to me they booked me three four shows a day uh, on Saturdays and Sundays so I had to rejuvenate I had to get my energy back so I'd sit in the car I'd make sure I'm there 10 minutes before to allow some time to set up and meditate I'd feel very grounded. I'd go in there, set up, do my show, give it my best, pack everything up, run back to the car and sit and meditate, focus so I could drive properly to the next gig. So meditation had always been and still is a big part of my life for essentially grounding myself. We can get all esoteric and say, oh, we experienced the divine during that. And, and, and for many, that's valid. That's, that's what they experience. Uh, I sort of experienced something like that. 
but it's very subjective. What is the divine? Is the divine light? Is the divine music? What is the divine? Go to Sanskrit and look it up and start to, to research. <laughs> that, absolutely, because as you say, you know, some people have this feeling that, you know, if you've got to meditate, it's something like the Maharishi and you sit there chanting Om, and that's cool. That's your thing. But in terms of performance, and again, I have to say, you and I kind of click because we are so into all of that, shall we say. You know, we have rituals. I have a ritual. I have, you know, put my pants on, then my boots, and then I do some Tai Chi movements in a quiet corner. Then, you know, the shirt goes on and the makeup and, you know, jacket and all that kind of stuff. So I get where you're coming from. Is this for everybody? I would like to say, oh my gosh, yes, I hope it is. Whatever it may be. It may be some, as you were saying, it could be music. Someone's just putting on, um, you know, putting some earbuds on and listening to, to, to some music. I know uh, my son and indeed several other people, that's exactly what they would do. They would put this on and, you know, it was blasting music. That was there meditation if you like getting getting into character i think we have a picture of you here which i'm i'm quite fond of because it in many ways as a visual illustrates quite a lot of what you were saying and if people look very closely at that for a few seconds they'll understand this is you with the seven of hearts i particularly wanted that in there it is yeah we'll bring it up on the screen uh, yeah there's something about that i think which encapsulates everything that you were just talking about. In case people have missed it, let me just draw attention to it. There's a sword. And it's not just any sword. The colors of your vest, waistcoat, your cravat, the expression on your face, that stained glass window in the back, all of that kind of brings together, for want of a hackneyed expression, I suppose, um, a kind of element of wonder and this is what we're giving our audiences would you say absolutely it's all about wonder and this is one of the aspects that i rediscovered this year believe it or not after more than 40 years of performance i had it as a kid that wonder that excitement i had it when i was performing uh in the 80s and 90s sort of my peak if you will on television live shows and then I don't know. It's like there was this plateau and I became too serious. Perhaps it was when I was doing my studies and my and my practice, if you will. And I sort of lost that. You never really lose that. But where was that spark, that joy, if you will? And I began to rediscover it after I'd gotten all my degrees about six, seven years ago when I full-time got back into magic consciously mm -hmm. and in this last year or so when I rejoined all the magic groups and more and uh, started buying it was like a whole new world as far as the magic world is concerned different kinds of dealers different kinds of selling tricks and I don't want to get into that at this moment but I'd rather get into the joy and the excitement mm -hmm. and, and that energy of yes. wonder because that to me, is truly what life is. Uh, you know, um, we all have our ups and downs, our apparent ups and downs in this lifetime. And what we can judgmentally say is tragedy or joy. And really, it's our perspective. Let's say someone close to us has passed away. Well, we can perceive that as loss, as tragedy, as, oh my goodness, I'm, you know, I've got the sense of loss. Well, it all becomes about yourself and how you're emotionally dealing or not dealing with it. Or you can shift that, it's all about attitude, and shift that to something positive, like, oh good, they've, for lack of a better term, they've transitioned into something else or better. Who knows what? We don't really know. We think we know, but we don't really know. And that's part of the excitement and mystery of this life, I believe. So we can turn tragedy, sadness to joy, that ever-present joy, and excitement by tapping into meditation, by tapping into drawing, art, music, any of the creative endeavors, I believe a lot of people would say, well, that's source, if you will. Mm. I ascribe to that. I believe that a great way to describe source is creation, is creativity, 
because there it is. There is that spark that made something, that spark that drew something, that spark that played music, that spark that did magic on stage and saw kids. Yeah. Smile, laugh. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm briefly going to um, do a very related story to when I did a children's hospital out here, if I can keep it together. So um, at the time, I was always doing sponge balls as part of my little routine. There was a little boy in bed, uh, all wired up. And I did my usual routine. He held the ball, it vanished, it reappeared, it transformed. And he laughed and he smiled, as was usually the case. It's something I took for granted. Later, one of the nurses came up to me and said, this is really hard. He hasn't smiled in six months. It's the first time he's smiled. So that's, that's magic. I, I may have mentioned it before, uh, but it's worth mentioning again because I remember one time some years back, it was Dan Garrett, myself, Dan Harlan, and Simon Lovell. You know, you do, you hang out and you have a meal afterwards and all that kind of thing. And just very briefly, you just jog my memory on this. It's a story that Simon Lovell told. If you can fast forward, there he is being moved out of somewhere in Bosnia or Herzegovina or wherever that was some years ago. Right? It's all changed now in different countries, names, etc. And they threw them all on a truck with some kids. He found out later that these kids were traumatized and they were orphaned. And they were like 8, 10, maybe the oldest was about 12. Um, you know, bumping flat red truck, trying to get them to safety with Simon and a few other UN people or whatever. And he just said that he just picked up a, a pebble, a stone, which is lying in a flatbed truck like you do you know and he just did that and disappeared and one little fella apparently just burst out laughing just burst out laughing he found out later from the lady who was in charge of all these children now this boy was so traumatized from the war and watching his parents being bombed out and etc had not spoken or said a single word to anybody for x months i have no idea how long uh, so there is that side of what we do, and very often we, I think all of us, are never always fully aware of the effect that we have. I'm going to embarrass him like hell by bringing up his name. I know he's here with us, and I acknowledged him, and that's dear Keith Churcher, a good, good friend of mine from, from, from England. Um, they did a huge tribute for him at the Magic Circle. When I say huge, you know, star-studded and awarded him an MIMC and Gold Star, etc. And he had no idea of the effect he'd had on a lot of these young guys that had gone on to become TV stars and superstars and all that kind of thing. So it's, it's, it's that giving and it's that sharing. And I hope, and I know you agree with me on this, I really know that you do, that, you know, that is part of the magic. It's not just disappearing a sponge ball or sawing a lady in half it, that there is that side and that comes from that energy we we spoke about and speaking of energy um i know in fact that you, you you've you've done uh, a few performances uh, which include the sam one was for our resourceress sarah cranson up in new york which was a virtual show and that you did a few months ago but prior to that I had put a show that I'd spoken with Most Illustrious and decided, hey, let's just do a gala show. And it's on the showcase, which Most Illustrious will put in the chat. It was the first ever gala show. And I remember coming to you and saying, you know, would you be kind enough to take part? And without hesitancy, you went, yes, can I help? And I said, well, I can't draw a straight line with a ruler. I need a poster. And you went, I can do that. And I said, well, we'll need a promo video. And you went, I can do that. And there you were, you, you just jumped in and it was all there and you took part of this performance and we'll put up a little thank you that you got from the president. There it is. Aww, that was so special. So signed special. by Dr. Joel Vatman Zawitsky. Yes. I mean, it so is special. special. It is special. Yeah, that, that, that's amazing. And this is the caring because I had not asked him to do this as the producer of the show. He, as the president, just took it upon himself to send one of these to every performer. Ah, that meant that's, so that's the caring that I want to bring the message across today of what we're about, what the SAM is about, the caring people in the SAM. You know what? I'm going to show a little clip of you 
not all your performance in the gala show, the gala show, whichever way you want to pronounce it. Uh, I guess we'll have to pronounce it gala tomorrow night, but we'll, we'll talk about that another time. Um, we'll just, just bring up a little clip of something that you did on it, which was I thought was just amazing. You did a lot of stuff, but this I kind of liked very much. So we thought, let's just run it. Wow. <laughs> wow. Love it. 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 But I also wanted to play that clip, not just to show people a little bit of what, what you did, but I think that also encapsulates everything from character, visual, how you were dressed, framing. It wasn't like everywhere, jumping around. It was framed. It was always there. It was great effect, obviously. I don't do it, but great effect. And the choice of music, all of these things that come together to make an effect, to make a show. So what are your thought processes? I mean, do you start from, hey, this is what I want to achieve and work backwards? Or do you start with an idea and go forwards? How does that all come together? Using, of course, your chi and ki and prana. <laughs> chi ball. Yeah, exactly. The chi ball. Indeed, <laughs> indeed, indeed. Yes. Yes. So essentially, uh, it's the concept. It's what do I want to achieve? Now, that particular effect is timeless. It's been around a, a good long time. And those of us who are historians or, or love research will know it's not a new effect. And I'd actually forgotten that and being on the, on the west coast of Canada, Vancouver, B.C., very, very world famous magician lived here and um, his son is a member of the uh, Society of American Magicians, the local uh, assembly here. It's a Leon Mandrake. Oh, yes. <laughs> he presented yeah. that. I never saw him do it. Uh, I have to, you know, unfortunately admit. But I saw Harry Anderson back in the 90s, I believe it was late 80s, 90s, do it on Johnny Carson. And I loved it. And, and I was stumped. And I thought, what the heck? He's not... Oh, I can't reveal some stuff. No, but no, you mustn't. Using, he's no. not using the usual methodologies mm. to create what you guys just saw right now. And so I had to go research it. It, it. it thrilled me. It excited me. I purchased from a couple of magic shops in the States two versions of it and then disassembled everything and made it my own because mm. each of them had their pros and cons, but it had to be a certain way for me uh, we'll say mechanically, in order for it to fulfill something. Mm. It's all about, you kind of have to put yourself in the audience's eyes. Yes. Um, how will it look to your audience? And how will they feel? So you have the physical, you have how will it look, and then you have, well, is it emotive? Does it, where's the emotion coming from? What is it touching off? And that's where I use music. And I believe that's so important. If I can, I use Disney-like music because they're the masters of emotions going up and down and they play with your emotions a lot in all of their productions. Of course, we can't, um, because of copyright reasons, use actual Disney music. So I go on uh, YouTube and, and find copyright-free music that feels joyous or mysterious mm. or exciting something mm. that will spur someone like seeing things through the eyes of a child and i i hope that all of us can get there maybe some of us are there already see things wondrously as if we're children again and that's what i hope to i don't know if i succeeded hope to create that sense of wonder that sense of magic that sense of wow this is so cool how did that happen or 
wow, maybe you're still, and, and you're excited. Everyone expresses emotions differently. They get all animated like I do, or, or they sit very stoically, but they're very excited as well. So um, that's the thought process of this. What is it going to look like in the audience's eyes physically? Is it miraculous? Is it a visual? Is it a one-off? Is it a story? Lately in the last year or so, I've been sort of getting into more storytelling with magic, a non-verbal, if you will, script. And um, secondly, the music for emotion. And uh, hopefully we're left with a good product at the end. <laughs> well, let's face it, Michael, we all get to that stage, some of us sooner than others, when we have to stop doing, ah, it just doesn't look good on an old guy. <laughs> I, 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 I'm being silly to make a serious point that, you, that you've raised, and I think it's important if we're talking about performance, where we have to understand the character that we are and our limitations and then adapt accordingly. You can't go from bringing the Ringo kid as John Wayne on stagecoach to then becoming, you know, a slightly bigger, less leaner gentleman in the shootest or a one-eyed marshal in true grit. So I'm just using those just to kind of say, we have to adapt. You're still essentially John the Duke, you know, but you have to adapt according to, you know, when you get broader and maybe the knees don't move as fast or whatever. Um, and I think that that's going to lead me very nicely into, I think, the book. That, in fact, I want really for you to talk about how that came about. We can't possibly put everything in it. I mean, I spent almost an entire night reading it from cover to cover. Boom. Everything. Everything. Wow. Because you very kindly said to me afterwards, well, what do you think of it? And would you write a foreword? And I said, yeah, I will write a foreword, little realizing what I got into. Uh, it, it was fascinating. And I thought, all I can say, I mean, people want to get it and read the foreword, they can. That, you know, that's not what it's about. It's about you. I happen to think that it's required reading for any magician at whatever level. I mean, that's all I can say. Because I agree with you. Oh, there's the cover with the ah. foreword. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, 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 there we are. Um, yeah, some guy called Anthony Darkstone was asked to write the foreword, as I mentioned. So yes. uh, but in the foreword, I'm not going to read it out. I, I can't get to it. Uh, but I, I, I'm saying, look, this is required reading, not because, you know, people don't know what to do. There are a lot of books, you know, from Daryl Fritzke and people like that, that are, for one of a non-sacrilegious term, our Bible, our sacred writings, whatever, uh, no offense meant to anybody. Uh, this one is, I think, belongs with that because you've gone into incredible depth, including photographs of you doing some Tai Chi movements. You, you explain about the preparation into becoming a performer. And what I liked about it was you understood the concept of being a product. So when a client calls you, that's when the product happens. Exactly. That's when the gig begins. <laughs> it's almost the ending of the gig when you're physically in the studio and television or on a stage as we've done over the years. Um, it's that first part. The negotiation, how they perceive it, how that happens. And back in the day, well, yours and my day anyway, we didn't have websites. We didn't have, you know, it was only relatively later we had a CD or a DVD you could send to someone. So you had to talk to people on the phone. Yeah. You had to convince somebody you were worth, you know, three grand or whatever, yes, to be booked. So the book goes into that. Um, and what I'd like you to do, in fact, is you're the author. And you're a producer and host on many shows, etc. which when people Facebook you and go on to your different Facebook groups, uh, they, will, they will see many of the things you do, which I can't possibly cover. But I do want to focus a little bit on the book and I think kind of lead you into how, why and what and how it happened. <laughs> Very good. And, and thank you for those kind words about the book, by the way, both the foreword and your words right now, because personally, well, I believe I could have got, gone into more detail. And, and I was actually quite nervous sending it to you because I thought, oh dear, I, I could have said this and I could have said that and I could have added this. And, you know, but my wife often says to me, a lot of people just won't get it. You, you've given them so much 
even though you think you haven't. So how it came about was just in a couple of months, I can write a 300 page book in a month because I organize my time uh, apparently quite well. This is half of that uh, amount of pages, but it came about as a result of my journey to the magic circle where I refound, if you will, the magic of life. And then I kind of worked backwards. I kind of traced it to everything we were speaking about today. What are the origins of it? Oh, yes, meditation. Oh, yes, energy. Um, all of this. And I'm going to get a little bit woo-woo. I sort of channel my books. Uh, for, for people who get that, they know what I mean. For people that don't get that, it just means, well, there's a flow to it. And I don't know where it comes from. But I just type. I type. I don't even consciously know what I'm typing. I sort of have an agenda day by day, if you will, and it, and it hopefully comes to fruition. And this was as a result of my journey and refinding, if you will, the magic of life. And for years, I could not find an intersection between metaphysics and performance magic. I couldn't. I tried working that into my Sunday morning metaphysical meetings uh, as, as Reverend Dr. Michael. It didn't work. It was all segmented. But this year, very, very special year, on my journey towards the magic circle, what I did was uh, I worked with music first. I knew what effects I was basically going to do. Right. That cups and balls was a routine I did all the time in my shows more than 20 years ago brought it back out. My cups and balls were, were not in good shape. I had to buy new cups and balls. Meanwhile, my exam was coming up. So I worked backwards. I looked at music. I, I said, okay, I know what the visuals are going to be. What is going to be a motive? And essentially, that's what it's all about, is the emotion behind it. And the giving, the giving of stuff. If, if we all only realize we're only here on this earth to give, that's all. And the receiving just comes naturally. It's sort of like, again, I don't want to get too metaphysical, but Einstein said, as far as energy is concerned, whatever you put out comes back in a big circle. Now, that's kind of Taoist as well. Oh, very much so. And absolutely true. When you don't think of yourself, except to maybe do the best you can do and then just give it, it sort of works. So the journey towards the book is a journey to hopefully help others to find some sort of meaning in their performance art, be it magic, be it juggling, be it clowning, be it stage acting, um, and creating that character. I included in the book my book on creating your own character because I thought, oh, I can't ignore this. It sort of segued into that. So they're kind of getting two books in one, if you will. And the product, if you will, that's on stage should be you, should be a mirror, either literally or figuratively of who you really are inside. Then the audience will be moved. They'll get you. And, and you're a winner already. I, I no longer choose to run out on stage and jump about like I used to, even as recent as a couple of years ago. There's more a stoicness and a giving of energy that's mm -hmm. returned in, in many different ways. And I hope that people that read the book will discover that. I'm pretty sure they'll get quite a few things out of that book. Oh, I'm, I'm absolutely sure of that because you reminded me of a wonderful uh, quote because you and I, as you know, we, we have spoken about these topics long into the night, as it were. Uh, uh, and, you know, I'm very much into a, a lot of this and I think it has made me the performer that I am today. And of course, you know, with dear people like dear Eugene, who I, you know, the times we hung out, I never actually talked magic effects with him. We would talk about metaphysics and, and other things, you know, maybe his memory be a blessing. Um, now, there, there, there was a man, I think, you know, one could sit at his feet literally and just listen and if you were open to learning there was so much you could absorb because he never taught anything he just gave you things and you choose like a sponge to absorb it and then make it your own or or ignore them at your peril <laughs> so yeah basically in fact um i think your book encapsulates a lot of that and it's certainly stimulating because 
some of the fun posts that I put up. I said, who are all these people? What are they going to do coming to the show? Um, you know, those people were you and I in different characters. And, you know, I threw a Yoda in as well because I wanted subtly to people to understand that a Yoda is not actually teaching you anything. He's holding up a sign. He's not an instructor. He's not a teacher. He's holding up a sign. And these are all true Taoist masters. Yes. Uh, from uh, anyone who's read Lao Tzu will know this, that you discover, not interpret, but discover. He's not actually teaching you anything. Um, so, yeah, I think you know, how do how do people get a copy of this book, Michael? Is it hardback? You've got it on Amazon. How do they go about this? Essentially, it's through Amazon um, because we rewrote it, um, mm -hmm. correcting some things. I literally gave in the corrected version just before we went to air today. So okay. give it a couple of days. I mean, you could purchase it right now from Amazon, but I'd rather you wait till about Tuesday. Okay. Um, this will air at all different times, but a few days from when you watch this, uh, go to Amazon, look me up. Um, Michael Likey, not Dr. Michael, not Magic Mike. You might find me in there, Magic Mike. Or Google the title um, or type in the title in the Amazon um, uh, page, if you will, page, and um, is, you'll find it. You'll and find the, it. the title is? Um, Metaphysics, Mysticism, and Performance Magic. It's also on my website. Okay. And people can is. contact you on Facebook, I imagine. Yes. Facebook is the easiest. I'm all yep. over Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, mm -hmm. uh, all social media. I'm all social media. It. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's not essentially a plug for the book. Well, it is in some ways because I think it contains such a wealth of information. Uh, and, you know, if you're like me and into that, you go, oh, yeah, I want it all. This is great. All of it. Uh, and then there are people who will pick and choose uh, bits of it. Yes. Because what I liked about the book is it's not authoritative. It's stimulating. It's Good. making people think. It's not saying Good. this is it. This is rigid. This is how it should be done. It's stimulating them to say, ah, that's interesting. You know? Like, like the way, you know, Vernon used to do. He would stand there and go, well, what if you looked that way and held the ring in this hand? Very good. He never said, look that way and hold the ring and, you know, tuck your stomach in. He, he kind of went, what if you... you know, and that, 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 I think, is the, the true mentor or whatever. And I think probably finish in terms of character uh, from a, a, the quote that I've used a lot, and I probably will again, uh, from Kirk Douglas, who said, look, it's not my job to convince myself I am Spartacus. It's my job to convince the audience that I'm Spartacus. <laughs> now, how apt is that for a magician? Yes. On that, on, on that note, I'm keeping an eye on the clock. We've come to our good hour and left out tons of your life, which people can catch up on if they befriend you. And I would heartily recommend that they do because you are a fascinating character and a really hell of a nice guy. Um, you know, there, I've said it publicly now. Uh, <laughs> no, I do not want anything for it. It's true. It's true. Uh, it, is, it is true. And people who have interacted with you and others in our uh, International Assembly will know that. And speaking of the International Assembly, if there's anybody on here uh, who would say, oh, that sounds interesting. I'd like to be a member of the SAM. Uh, fine. Just go to magic, www, of course, magic, SAM, magic, Sam, dot com. You'll see a gray button there underneath the photographs of uh, Max Maven, David Copperfield, Matt King, etc. Uh, yes, they are all members of the SAM. <laughs> That's why their pictures are there. So you'll be in good company. And that green button says International Assembly. And if you just push it, uh, there's a whole load of information there, right down to photographs, which contains yours as well. And indeed, dear Rod Chow and a few other people, Harriet J Jacobson is here. And I, I've just said to my dear friend, Keith Churchill, who's here today, um, great legend in, in, in magic and helping people, that you know, I invited him to become an honorary member. Uh, that were good, because he has a lot of people that he will talk to about the assembly, I'm sure. Uh, so, okie dokie. Um, that brings us, I think, neatly to a close. All remains for me is to say th thank you very, very much, as always, to most illustrious jo Dr. Joel Zeritsky. Thank you very much to 
all our International Assembly members, our President-elect Tom Gentile, and of course our first VP, Rod Chow. And I think there is somebody I should say a huge thank you to, and that'd be you, Michael. Thank Thank you so much. Uh, Not at all. Thank you for taking the time. I believe the hand clap in uh, Zoom, I've been taught, is this. So (laughs) I I think everybody's going to be doing that for you, I hope. So thank you so much for coming and sharing, oh, just a tiny fraction of Dr. Michael, Magic Mike Likey. I think we'll just open up the chat and schmooze a little bit, as most illustrious calls it. And just, you know, chat to each other and people maybe want to ask you some questions and so on. So my thanks to all involved. Thank you all for attending. So for me, thank you so much to, 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 to all. And I think now I will turn it over to Dr. Joel and he will open up the chat and the microphones. And you can unmute yourself. It's time for the schmooze and mingle. I have a question here for uh, Batman. Over in chat, we've only got two people we can address. That would be you and Brett Saul. If you could open that up so that everybody can be, we can get a chat in there to everyone. That's what we're doing now. Getting it all open for you. <clears throat> no problem. Very good, Joel. Thank you. Quick question, Magic Mike. Yes, sir. I, I at my age, you get a lot of dis, a uh, lot of cross communication. Are you a quick draw artist? Uh, I am. I don't okay. know if you knew that, but I am a caricature artist by trade and a graphic designer by trade. All right. Well, I'm not sure what Tom meant. But not a, like but a not a drawing. six gun, but not a, <laughs> okay. a, a pistol quick draw. Yes, absolutely. How did you know? I, I, didn't you do another lecture or talk about six months ago and you exhibited a quick draw? No, no, that wasn't me. I wish it was, but it wasn't. Uh, I think, I think, I think, I think Tom, we were going to do, I know what it was. It was when I did the Darkstone dossiers with you, yeah. with Rod and Joel. And then we came on, and I think I put one of these on and put my rig on and show you guys some fast drawing. Yeah, yeah, you did that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. there was someone else that did a quick. Ah, okay. Huh. okay. Are you in the no, Guinness Book of World Records, Tony? Ah, <laughs> uh, no, sir. No, no, okay. I, uh, this, I ain't that good. <laughs> this gentleman is, is a magician. I, I, and I don't know. Maybe it's the other organizations uh, series, but uh, he, I swear, he. It was a, he said he's in the Guinness Book of World Records for the quick draw. And then I saw you, Tony, Anthony, yep. do yep. it. And yep. I, and then I thought Magic Mike was. So, okay, <laughs> you guys will be my age. Uh, nobody's your age, Tom. You're forever 23. You're going to have a deal with Batman over there now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know. Hey, we're, we're getting ready get, for tomorrow. Tomorrow night we're in get, Texas. We're, we're getting ready. We're getting ready for tomorrow. <laughs> we're getting yeah, ready for we're tomorrow, tomorrow, Texas. Tomorrow. And I'll tell you, I'll, hey, oh, I'll tell you what, man. Oh, now you got them going. Oh, we'll get a bang out of this. Oh, get ready for Texas tomorrow. How does this work? Oh, I got to take it off. <laughs> okay, yeah. I'll tell you, man, you, the, you go to the International Assembly page or Scott Wells's page and the links. And it, you got to register. If you don't register, you can't get there, okay? They won't let you in. Don't register, I tell you. This is going to be so much friggin' fun. It's unbelievable. But yeah, that's what you saw, Tom. That you saw my rig, yeah? I saw that, yeah. Yeah, my rig in Winchester and all that stuff. Oh, gosh, should I be doing that on Zoom? Is no. that a 44? No, sir. That's a that's a 45 double action. 45? Wow. Wow. Double action, yeah. Wow. And yeah. Well, well, Joel, Joel, Joel's got a nice one. That that's a, that's, a, that's a navy coat, right? 44? Yeah, he's got a Navy coat. Yeah. Is that a 44, Joel? Yeah, that's right. It's from yeah. the, the movie The Good, The Bad, The Ugly, right? One of my favorite movies of all time. Have you fired it? Replicated. Which, which one are you, Joel? The Good, The Bad? Well, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> like a little those, bit of all three. Those are operable? <laughs> yeah. Mostly the ugly. If we're going to be doing this, guys, and I've got my peacemaker with me. 
There you oh, go. you're yeah. here. I'm Paul here. Abbey. Oh, for goodness sakes. Yeah. Oh, let me take this hat band off. Um, <laughs> Sorry, yeah. I got a red eye into LAX and it was late. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, now that we're in, in the chat and informal and we're just hanging out, uh, Paul, oh, hey, Brutch got his hat too. Uh, this I this hat, got... I bought this hat in Tombstone, Arizona. Well, this, this, this <laughs> one, in fact, I like, and I'll tell you for why. It's the only one that I've, I've got like about eight of them, and this is the only one that fits over the headphones. <laughs> and guess what? When I travel, I can do that. Oh, that's great. And it's oh, just that's cool. Mine's a, stet mine's a Stetson. I can do the same thing. It's crushable. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, no, I got one of those, man. I'll tell you, when it's crushable and it's like, you know, 16 hours on a plane and you're... Throw your luggage, you're good baggage, to go. You're, sp oh, yeah. you're spending time with the kettle straight and, you know, the steam, the broom. This thing is just so cool. You know, it's just easy. But listen, I know, it, you know, I know you guys want to talk and I don't want to hog it all, but... <laughs> Yeah, I, yeah, but I just got to introduce my very, very, very good pal, also uh, from England, who is uh, 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 AIMC with a silver star like myself at the Magic Circle. Uh, and we have some cool videos of us in Chinatown, London. And Paul is, oh, yeah. is Sifu, who, who is, which is a chi Chinese word for like teacher, master, uh, that sort of thing. Um, and I particularly wanted Paul to be here because, you know, we were talking about those things. So, Paul, uh, say a few words about your Tai Chi and how it's helped your life and your magic and things like that. I think folks would like to... Oh, well, th this this is really cool. And, and thank you, Mr. Likey, for, for your, your chat. I'm sorry I was a little bit late, but um, things that you were saying um, about uh, what you do in your performance are so true. Uh, I've, I've actually used a lot of my, my Tai Chi influence in with my own act. It's strangely the same as uh, Jeff McBride when I was talking to him. Um, it's just basically the movements. You know, you, you've got these lovely fluid uh, movements that you use. So when I'm using like a coin move um, and, a, and a vanish, I, I use the same movements. My stage movements are very similar. Um, but uh, I've been doing Tai Chi uh, for uh, about 30 odd years. And um, I, I kind of turned to that because I had a lot of injuries. I'd done a lot of heavy duty uh, martial arts and really kind of wrecked my knees and stuff. And, uh, and Tai Chi actually saved my knee for an operation. Now I'm working on my arthritic hip. <laughs> no doubt you'll fix it or Tai Chi will fix that. I had the same problem with a knee, which was virtually destroyed. That's it took me a couple of years using Tai Chi and, and Ling Chi and Reiki. And it's healed. Well, it's I, yeah, I can, I, I can abso abso absolutely go along with that, guys. Well, Paul, you know that, right? Okay. Um, yeah. you, you, you know that about all the, you know, things from martial arts and the Tai Chi and the Tao, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, well, Joel also knows. I mean, there was one show I had to, like, tank up with some tablets because my back had gone, just boom, went. That was it. You know, there's no time to go and get a massage or anything. Well, actually, plenty of time to get a massage, but, you know, I couldn't go out and get one for obvious reasons. So, you know, stuff happens. Uh, but I kind of like what Walter Blaney says, you know, die young, as old as possible. That's another one. You know, bless, ble blessings to his memory. May his memory be a blessing. Uh, yeah, beautiful man, if you knew him. Uh, very honored and humbled and privileged that, that I did. And spent great times with him. But anyway, uh, yeah, that's, I love that. You know, die young. And as performers, whether particularly as a magician, uh, you can be in another performing art, you know, a musician or whatever other performing art. But as a magician, there's something that we're doing that we're forcing this audience to, oh gosh, I hate this cliche, but there isn't any other way of expressing it, suspend their disbelief, however momentarily. Would you agree with that, Michael? Absolutely. And Absolutely. this is where... As Paul was saying, you know, if you're doing a little movement um, from, you know, doing that, yes, which is kind of interesting, but when mm. you're tight, you, when you're using your chi or key and you're reaching up there like this, and then you bring it back to yourself, that enhances something. I mean, this looks okay and it's good, oh. but this, in my humble opinion, is so much better i mean you know obviously I'm well, that, that's uh, that's a classic actor's uh, thing anthony i mean uh, yeah, i'm, I'm an is. actor trained by i know that i know and, that uh, yeah. 
you know, and, and the thing with Tai Chi is a body discipline. So, I mean, one of the things that my teacher used to say, he said, yeah, you, you move well on stage, but that was because of my martial arts thing. But when I, when I pick a coin out of the air, I see it. I don't, I don't just go, oh, there's a coin. I have mm. to see that coin. And I actually focus on that point. Even though there's nothing there to focus on, I'll focus on that point right there and I'll take that coin and I'll mm. be watching it all the time. But you've got to have that, that discipline because people will grab things. But as you know, uh, Mr. Likey, you'll, you'll, you'll be reaching with a little bit of finesse, that little tiny thing, because it's only a kind of a thin sliver of metal. So you're not, you're not grabbing a, a stick, you know, you're, you're, you're grabbing a tiny thin little piece of metal. And it's it a belief it as well. It, I actually believe, and it's very much akin to what you just said, Paul, is that I see it, I believe it, and therefore the audience will as well. If you believe it, yeah. they will as well. Yeah. That's automatically telegraphed on a non-physical level. And it's like, I actually believe I'm holding a silver coin right now in this hand. It's not a big one, but it's about yay big. I believe it, and I can lay it there. And even part of my hand, I guess you can't see that, part of my hand will even crease up in such a way to hold the weight of it. Subconsciously, I've telegraphed that. So there's a belief involved as well in everything that you're doing magically on stage, um, except for vanishing the elephant. If you really believe you're vanishing an elephant, better get an <laughs> elephant first. <laughs> <laughs> or a large mirror. Yes. <laughs> okay, there's a technique in uh, improvisational theater that basically addresses the same thing. It's uh, called space objects, giving, giving reality to your space objects. You have to give them weight and size and, and everything. You have to believe it's there. Yes. Um, so, yeah, improv can kind of cross over the same thing. That's all. You're, 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 right, you're, right, you're right, Brett, because martial arts training, and I'm not talking about, you know, watching sort of ninja movies and going, yeah. And that's, it, it's not what it's all about, because as my Sifu said mm -hmm. many, 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 many years ago, oh God, 50 something years ago when I was in my 20s, why would you want to break a brick? A brick's not going to jump up off the ground and hit you, right? So you, you need to figure out a way of how to avoid a brick being thrown at you. And it's not always speed. It can be sometimes, you know. That, that fast, I mean, you know, not bad for an old guy. Yeah, I'm praising myself. <laughs> but it's not always about that. It's about yeah. what you were saying, Michael, that containment of the energy is the release of the energy and it's bringing it back. Yes. I mean, would absolutely. you and Paul and anyone else who wants to join in on this, by the way, this particular topic, you see, if you take a garden hose, it's fairly limp. It, it, there's nothing to it. It's nothing but like this, just limp. But the moment water goes through it, or a big fire hose, even a simple garden hose, it, you know, you try bending it when there's water going through it. That's the chi. That's the energy. So, Absolutely. yeah, as you, as, as you were saying, I mean, I know you've gone into this in some detail in your book, and I was fascinated by it. As I said earlier on, I just sat there and I thought, okay, I'll just start this. And then, like, hours later, I'm like, okay, 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 wait, I need to go to the bathroom, and I'm right back now, and I'm reading it, you know. And it just did. Am I plugging it? Well, yes. Why am I plugging it? Do I want everybody to go, um, you know, everybody to go out and buy it? Well, no, that's, that's your problem. I'm plugging it because I think it's something, if you're seriously performing magic, I don't care what you do, if it's just one effect, the book stimulates your thinking as to how you could be doing it. I didn't say should, but how you could. Can I can I jump in there, Tony? Absolutely, Paul. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I think I, I've, I've got to um, add to that because one of the things, because uh, you know I teach as well. Uh, yes. Uh, yes I it's like I actually teach in England as well. I, I, run a, I run a college up in London for magic. And uh, one of the things I tell my students is don't stand on the stage or do the close-up and entertain people trying to convince people that you're fantastic and you're great. That's not what it's all about. It's about making them feel that they're being entertained. So it's the same when I'm entertaining, I have exactly the same attitude um, when I bring people up onto the stage. Um, the most important person on that stage then is the person who's with me, not me. And, and then that gives me this attitude 
which which I think is what magic is all about. It's the same as an actor, you know, you're, you're, you're playing a character. I do everything tongue in cheek and I just want people to have fun. Uh, so that that way, if you screw up and things do screw up, then it's oh, yeah. fun. You know, it's it's I remember Paul Daniels saying to me, you know, this is this is a brain surgery. It's entertainment. And uh, and all that sort of all that stuff kind of connects to my Tai Chi beliefs and feelings and everything that you you've been talking about mr like i'm i'm intrigued now i think i've got to get this book (laughs) (laughs) i agree with you a thousand percent it's about them it's about your audience and uh, I've, i've used and i i have the same attitude when i have someone up on stage be it a grown adult or a child it's all about them i'm not there to make fun of them i'm there to make them feel good and look good period I'm the catalyst for that, if you will. And also that helps with nerves. I have someone very close to me who had to give a presentation at school. She's, she was a teaching assistant and she was so nervous. And I said, well, that's because it's all about you. Make it about them. You love those kids. It's for mm-hmm. them. You know, have the energy, the attitude that you're giving something to them. She wasn't nervous at all when the time came. So it's, it's about giving. And when you have that attitude, mm-hmm if you will, of, of giving, of, of, you know, it's, it's not all about me. I'm not here to pose and do whatever. I'm, I'm here to create wonder and touch something within my audience, my assistant, etc. Then you've got it. That's the essence. Absolutely. I, 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 absolutely. I think this is, this is paramount. Um, you know, am, am I going to plug it? Well, in a way, yes, yes. I belong to the Magic Circle, as, as, as everybody knows, as does Paul and Michael and uh, Most Illustrious, et cetera, et cetera, and the IBM and, and, and so on. But, you know, this camaraderie, this givingness is probably more prevalent in the SAM. I mean, I'm going to embarrass you, Paul. A little bit, <laughs> not too much, <laughs> because in a conversation with Paul about a week ago, he said to me, Do you know what? I feel I'm here in England and I feel so welcome at the SAM. I feel so welcome in the International Assembly. I feel like I'm actually really? part, part of something. Am I right, Paul? You actually said that? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, how many people out there are feeling that way? And I think that's because of most illustrious, because of uh, President-elect Tom, because of first VP Rod, because of many unsung heroes in the background, Marlene, uh, the secretary at the National Council meetings. And I always praise this lady. I mean, she does an amazing job and helps me with recruiting people in the assembly. And well, not, not with recruiting, but the paperwork that goes with it, as you all guys know. Uh, you know, you get your pins, your certificates and all the rest of it. And that, you, that's Manuel Rodriguez. Uh, so there's this whole camaraderie and this nature of giving. You know what? I'm going to be quiet. I've got three experts here about that, which is most illustrious, Tom and Rod. You guys talk about it, you know? Go ahead. Talk about this giving us. The energy. The, the energy. energy. All over the place. Even here. That's right. <laughs> oh, actually, listen, I'll tell you what. Why? Right? Tom spent a yep. fortune mailing this out to me. Well, it's just giving. I mean, you know, that, yeah. that's, that's all it is. That's all it is. Uh, so well, look how many yeah. smiles you've had. Uh, but I'm sure, yeah, exactly. No, you, Tom, because t- t- you know, you, you, you three guys, you know, we're informal now. Uh, we three, you three guys came on the Darkstone dossiers and we talked about the past, the present, and the future. Yeah. Um, and you're kind of, very near future, yes, because you're very going to near future president in, in July. Yeah, yeah. In it's coming July. right, it's coming quick. Yeah. yeah, it's coming quick. You want to talk about the giving and maybe you know, Joel and Rod, please chime in. I oh, think. this whole year, uh, we have uh, Joel has just brought everybody on this box office routine. Uh, every other Friday, we're cooking. We're uh, learning, there's lectures, uh, we're eating well, you know, the menus are well balanced. Uh, we have a lot of fun. Uh, it, it's just, we, it, we laugh, it's just a friendly atmosphere. We all have a good time. Uh, never, never, never. I've been a member 37 years. And this year, I think we are the closest 
because we've seen everybody three and four times a week uh, yep. enjoying magic. Uh, years ago, uh, the National Council got together and see me twice a year. And then whatever happened behind the scenes, well, behind the scenes are all the zooming. And we get so much done. We have so much planned. We have so much in store for the members, uh, friends of magic. Uh, there's a lot, lot coming in for the SAM. Uh, stay it's tuned. It's just about um, it's communication and camaraderie. But the most connection. important thing is about the members and Kip. Take it away, man. Connect. Oh. Yeah, thank, thank you. I, I had a question for uh, Dr. Michael. Oh, did he step away? I, I think briefly, yeah. Oh, okay. I will I will come back in when Dr. Michael is back. I had a question for him. Oh, okay. Yeah, I see his picture. He, 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 uh, Anthony, uh, yes, you were sir. talking about uh, the bricks. Uh, it brings up a story as a kid. My friend's father was a mason, and mm. he had pallets of bricks and mm. slate in the backyard. Well, his cousin was taken up karate. Mm. And then in one, like a couple of weeks, a couple of uh, afternoons, we went over the house and his cousin was practicing on all of these bricks in the backyard. Little did we know the father, who was a mason, had a future for those bricks. Ah. <laughs> and he broke like about three, three pallets of them. Yeah, boom, boom, boom. He had a great callus, but it his his uncle was not happy. <laughs> I bet, I bet, yeah. Uh, but, you know, it's 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 again. You know, there's different views on martial yeah. arts. I think if you view it for one of a better expression in parenthesis, yeah. almost as as Michael was saying, like a spiritual exercise. Yes, uh, then it becomes easier. Exactly. Uh, if yeah. you're trying to if you're trying to use brute strength, all you're going to do is break your hands. That's it. Yeah. That's it. You know, he finally it's, did. It, it, yeah. That's like a horse. I mean, you know, if, you, if, you, if you've got a Mustang and you, 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 know, you want to put a saddle on him, you got to take your time. I, I have a story about that. that too. I bet you do. You and I are going to get together. Uh, we get a few beers. Hey, speaking of get together before, be, be, before Kip jumps in with his question, two things. I got to First, okay, Tom, thank you, sir. Right. Uh, hopefully, you. maybe see you Tom, tomorrow. A lot of fun. Speaking, speaking of tomorrow, um, uh, I, I, I would ask Joel if he has it to put up the link where you register for the Houston Association Banquet of Magicians Banquet tomorrow with Gregory Wilson, Suzanne, who's going to be my guest on the next Dr. Stone Dossiers. Uh, and, oh, God, I keep forgetting his name, guy from Vegas. Uh, not Keith West, Fielding West, and Gregory Wilson, people like that. So if you can put that up in chat, you guys might want to make a note of it, go register. That's why we're all fooling around with all this stuff. And um, I'm thrilled to bitch because, you know, it takes me back to my Texas days and hanging out with all these. I just want to say something before Kip jumps in with this but, question. Yes, um, Ron, please. Yeah. So I just want to say that uh, there was a great interview, uh, Mike, uh, with Anthony. And, you know, the theme of this year is we are the energy. And you certainly have the energy, Mike, in uh, more ways than one. That Your background even is full of energy. And I noticed throughout the, the meeting that you're, even your hair lights up with, like, the energy of uh, whatever you have in there. And I was really impressed by your performance at the beginning, the MMC uh, award-winning performance. Uh, so that was awesome. And that showed a lot of energy as well, as well as the folding table. And your book is about energy. So you really are with the theme of the SAM. So thank you for being here. And then thank you, Anthony, for hosting all these um, Darkstone dossiers too, because that's something that we never had before. And this is a, a real benefit for the SAM that we have Anthony here uh, bringing members uh, into the into SEM from all over the world. And so, uh, yeah, really, yeah, put a, a nice uh, a hand up for Anthony to, to put on international galas, dark stone dossiers, and just to make SEM more uh, visible to everyone and invite everyone without any boundaries to, to come in and join the SEM and experience the energy that the SEM has and that we can offer back to everyone as well. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Oh, wow, Rod, thank you, thank you so much. That, what can I say? Um, obviously, Rod's going to become president in 2023, right? Have I got it right? Tom is 21 to 22, and then, no, oh, when, when do you become president? Right? 22. 22. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, as you can see, right, this is why I want these guys to talk about it. You saw the sincerity in Joel's voice, in Rod's voice, in Tom's voice. How they come forward, and this is 
contagious and, 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 and it, you know, it happens and it's just, you know, wonderful. Anyway, Kip, you had a question for Dr. Michael. I, I do. Dr. Michael, in your uh, conversation here today, you were talking about through your life, how your character had changed many times. Now, was that just because of you, you were keeping up with the ages or did you change the characters on purpose uh, to fill a particular market need? And when you did those character changes, did you change the magic that each character did? Just expand on that a little deeper, if you would. Excellent question, Kip. Thank you. Um, the answer to that is yes to all of it. Um, when I first started out uh, as a professional, if you want to call it, um, getting paid to do shows, I was just uh, in my head that stereotypical magician. I had even a black tux and, and the bow tie and all of that. And I did an awful lot of tricks for the money that I was getting paid. I had four tables of things, but I was quite young as well. I even did doves and rabbits and all of that. All the cliche, they're, they're classics, but they're cliche. They're the rings and the, the dye box and just all of that. And then as I gradually matured, um, if you want to call it maturing in my mid-20s, um, I, that's when I kind of keyed into that uh, Robin of Sherwood or Robin Hood series, a mystical version in the uh, mid-80s or so, and it touched something. And so I was really coming from the inside out. I wasn't, I, I was consciously not trying to fill a commercial need. Uh, I had my agents for that. When I first started out, I was knocking on doors. I looked like a regular magician. That's what they were expecting. That's what they got. But by then I'd had a few big agents and, and I'm not shy to say this because I'm grateful for it. Um, in Winnipeg, Canada, I'd moved there from Toronto. Um, and um, they just seemed to like me. I can't explain it. It's kind of like whatever I did, they, they really liked it. And uh, I was grateful for that as well. So I felt like I could do whatever I wanted. And that's when I was relaxing more. When you kind of are more relaxed, you're open. And perhaps the real me, if you will, was coming out. I, I, I was kind of rebelling back then too. I grew my hair long. I'm kind of a late bloomer. I didn't rebel when many people my age, which is 65, almost 65, um, began rebelling. I started doing that then, and it's kind of like, okay, this is what I'm gonna be. So my agents worked with that every time, every time I kind of shifted. As for the magic, yes, it did shift a bit. I never consciously, until the last 10 years or so, changed my props uh, to fit the theme or the mood of, of the show. Uh, I've got this really gnarly, if you will, um, uh, wand made out of a branch, an actual branch, which I shellacked and I attached a, a new age kind of crystal to it and, and put gold tape around it. And I seldom use that, but it's there. Uh, I used to use it. Um, and so I tried very much. As you know, you can't really just go to a magic shop or order online and, and get an 1800s looking prop. Uh, lately, I have been. I've been sourcing that out because I just dig. I really love the 1800s. I always did. Um, so I used to, I went through a phase where I liked medieval times, medieval days. The props in my costumes more or less reflected that. Um, and now it's 1800s, um, which I'm really excited about. And it just happens that that whole steampunk thing is popular. That's not why I'm doing it. I'm doing it because I like coincidentally, Westerns, uh, that 1800s kind of thing. I even had the Colonel Sanders tie and, and all that as part of my costume as well. And again, my props now are starting to be, I am sourcing stuff out, but not for magic shops with like little gears and windy things and stuff. And I've got this whole new show during the pandemic that I've been putting together. And hopefully once the pandemic is over, I'll debut live. If anyone out there is interested in, in, in having me do a show for free, because I, you know, I, I refuse to charge uh, online for my shows. Uh, perhaps that's a mistake. Perhaps someone would like to uh, voice their opinion about that. But I'm really excited. It's going to be gears and things. I don't want to give stuff away. But it's also more me. I'm not going to run around with a mutilated parasol anymore, which was so much a part of my 
my magic tricks. I'm not going to run around with the hoops. Those are all great tricks, but they're not so much me anymore. And the journey to the magic circle helped me see that Anthony was instrumental. I called him one day and I said, oh my God, I'm going to have this exam. I, I, and he says to me, what, well, what are you going to do? So I described my standard kids show that I've been doing on and off uh, in this version for the last 20 years, 10, 20 years. And he goes, you're bigger than that. You're better than that. Oh, that meant so much. That, those simple words helped me to raise myself such as I am, if you will, um, to strive for more, to see myself, to have a look at myself and go, hey, I'm not 20 anymore. I'm, I'm not going to run out and with all this energy. I mean, I could, and then I could die on stage, literally. So it was really Anthony who was the catalyst. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to thank you uh, specifically for that, for my journey, my growth. There has to be a catalyst for growth. And in that case, it was. Does that help at all, Kip? Yeah, it, it does. Uh, I might bounce this follow-up off of both you and Anthony, since how he helped you. Uh, so, for instance, like right now in my magic career, I have several personas depending upon the market I'm going to. I've got Kip Sherry. Let's call him the birthday magician. He can also be the corporate magician, the trade show magician. Uh, if I'm going to county fairs, I have a character complete with costume, custom props, the whole nine yards. Uh, Cletus Bugfester, he's an old ranch hand magician, rides a stick pony, and this stick pony reads minds, uh, sort of like Dana <laughs> Daniel's bird does. And uh, that's all set up for the county fair industry, 4-H, FFA audiences. And then I've got a con man character called uh, the Charitable Cheat. And he will go out to fundraisers and nonprofit organizations during their gala events and very proudly will cheat people out of their money. And everything he cheats them out of goes to the nonprofit organization. So it's entertainment and fundraising. So those are three of them that I've done. Add Zoom magician to, to it now after 2020. But uh, the, the thing that this does is it spreads me a little too thin. And maybe some of the advice Anthony gave you might be able to help me. I find it hard to advance to the next level because I'm so many different characters. Do, do I need to raise all three of them? Do I need to like maybe just focus in and just do one thing, like just purely be a mentalist or, you know, purely be a manipulator or, you know, just focus in on one thing and stop trying to spread myself into multiple characters or thoughts on that from either of you. Do you want to take that first, Michael? Sure. Um, first of all, who are you? And you have to be quite spontaneous for me to find the truth in anything. There's a spontaneity, a not thinking, a not being in one's head. I'm just like that. I'm black and white, very much black and white, all, all about marketing and shades of gray as well. So I consciously have to shut my, my mind off. I do it through meditation or whatever and, and just go for my heart. So who is Kip? Who is Kip? What feels right? And I guarantee you, if you don't think too much, the agents, if you want agents or if you have agents already, they'll, they'll be knocking down your door. They'll even, you know, you'll, you'll get that agricultural fair or that mall show or whatever. You know, I had agents booking me when I was uh, not in tights, but in that Robin Hood outfit for corporate events. And ordinarily, I'd be scared, you know, fill in the blank. Um, if, if I wasn't dressed up in my suit and tie, I'm Mr. Suit Guy as well. But no, they, they thought I was a novelty. They recognized that people would appreciate that. But more than that, I was being authentic. And if you're being who you are, that will be reflected on the outside. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. Oh, you know, uh, I, I've had two books held up for so long because I'm thinking too much. What market do I want to go to? You know, if I say this, this will be wrong. Well, you know, what? so now there's two books that really need to be written that I'm not writing because I'm, I'm, I'm doing this. I'm in my head too much. So go from your heart without fear. Fear. I watched The Blacklist last night. I don't know if anybody mm. uh, watches that or cares about that show, 
but it was something. No spoilers. I'll watch it. Okay. Yeah, um, don't Red spoil Reddington, it. Reddington, though, this I can say, he he does um, he says something for a friend who's passed away, and I thought, yes, I want to be like that person. I want to be fearless. I want to fear nothing. The only reason why we have fear is the longer we live, we have life experiences and, and something tells us don't go down that road. But what if you do? What if you don't think? What if we attain that freedom in our hearts and our minds that children still have? Yeah, so they fall, they scrape their knee, whatever. I guarantee you, Kip, nothing bad's gonna happen if you go from your heart. I guarantee you that. I think a lot in mine, there are so many factions of magic that I enjoy. Some I don't, but many of them I do. And not all of them fit Kip Sherry. You know, the charitable cheat, the con artist guy, that's not Kip Sherry. But I, I guess I see myself more as an actor playing the, playing the role of a magician. And much like an actor, as I go from movie to movie, my character that I play in this movie is different than the last one and the next one. And so the characters are fully developed. And when I'm in that character, I'm 100% there, but I see myself changing the character to fit the style of magic that I, I want that character to perform. Does that Absolutely. make sense? I, 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 think, I think as you've asked, have asked my views, firstly, I never give advice. I have conversations. <laughs> I hold up a sign. I hold up a sign. You know, um, well, what advice can I give anybody? I can't. I don't live in that person's mind, or as Michael says, heart. Yes, but I can kind of point to the pathway, so to speak. Yes, uh, the characters, as Michael was rightly saying, you have to. De I mean, you know, if you've been if you've been up and Paul Paul Abbey will tell us this, if you've been up to New York or you studied. I mean, he was on one of the shows, and we had a wonderful conversation. Bob Fitch, uh, you know, if you, if you don't know who that is in magic, well, I suggest you find out. <laughs> Many of us know who that gentleman is and you know the, the lee strasberg in new york and all this great method acting and things all of that is relevant um sometimes a gig will come up where you have to actually create a character i have one where it came about by accident my very good buddy uh i'm gonna have him on the show at some stage j scott berry called me up and he said well, he and my son he said i'd like you to come up to scotland and we're doing this this and this and it's the whole falcon thing of the weekend and i went oh wow great he said no you don't get it i want you to create a character i went okay uh where's kip is he disappeared i don't see him he's there oh Here. he always still here. oh you moved on the screen sorry <laughs> so long, long 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 story real short uh, we went off and I came back and I said, oh, I've got this from Deep Space Nine. I will be a Mimbari sorcerer or whatever. And he said, yeah, cool. I love it. Uh, if you know anything about J. Scott Berry, you'll understand. Uh, magnificent. I, mean, I love that guy. Really do. Um, so but then out of the blue somewhere, as Michael was saying, I sat there and the character wasn't comfortable. Could I play it if I was in a movie and someone gave me a script and said, these are your scenes, these are your lines? The short answer is, yes, I could. But I had to come up and be my own producer, my own director, my own character creator, all these things, which very often we all have to do anyway. And out of nowhere, Zadok was born. In Hebrew, it's pronounced Zadok, spelled Z-A-D-O-K. Yes? Um, and the byline came to me, and he speaks in a strange Sumerian accent, you know, with, with the makeup and the cloak and everything else. And it's greetings, I am Zadok, keeper of seal of ancient magi. You understand what my bad English? And, you know, this is how the character develops. And in the end, you get somebody to do something and you go, Hey, gee, Susan, that was really nice. Can you speak in them in a regular voice? Because they've been following this character. You know, it's live on the, on the stage. And it just cracks the audience up. But in the meantime, he's doing things like, look, we sit by fire and the Logan uh, smoke and the thing begin to rise. And, you know, all it is is a friggin' voodoo doll on my hand, you know, but I'm selling it in this crazy accent and, you know, do this and whatever. Because, as you rightly said, Kip, very often, the quote by Jean-Robert Houdin 
is misquoted. He never actually said the magician is an actor playing the part of the magician or an actor playing whatever the quote is that's misquoted. I urge you to look up the full one. He uses the word conjurer, which has an entirely different meaning in French. And that, if the whole quote is studied, you go, ah, got it. Now I've got it. What do I do with it? Yes. Uh, now, Brett Saul, I don't know if he's still around. I don't see him, but Brett was here and another good buddy of ours, uh, Mark Williams, who, uh, who who does all our editing and we'll be doing this one, in fact. I mean, I'm, we, I'm here. Yeah. Oh, thanks, uh, Brett. I mean, we stayed up, what, you know, we hours with, with Rod when Rod was doing his, uh, his exam. We can tell people now, Rod, but when Rod was on the gala show, nobody knew. I knew and only Rod knew. That was his exam. They were actually watching him on the gala show. Guess what? This guy called Murphy turned up and he brought his law with him. It's just, just poor Rod started. God, my heart sank for him. His internet went boom. That was it. Gone. Oh, shit. He did the freaking exam. Nobody else knew. So, you know, being the director, producer on the show, we juggled it, whatever, brought somebody in. And, you know, nobody knew. That happened. And we brought Rod back in. He calmed down. And before that, we sat and Rod was going, I said, and then, isn't that right, Rod? We just kind of slowed you totally down. Do you remember? We did, yeah, during the rehearsal and everything. Yeah, during the rehearsal. We just slowed you totally down. I said, don't no, lose that, lose that, lose that. And then Rod was talking about something else and said, well, we don't need that. We don't need the, the reels. And we don't need, well, how about if you do it like this? And how about if you do it like that? And we, we were so meticulous on this show. We got to the point of looking at his background and covering up, it's like a, a light sock or something with a yeah. the logo. Yeah. Just, we wanted it to be clean. We went through that. There's three of us. And then I had the Friday, I think, before the show, if I remember rightly, Rod. We sat up and we were going to the last bit. And then, and Rod was literally going out, a shot, coming back. What about that jacket? And I'm going, mm, not for that character. Then he'd come back wearing another jacket. And I went, yeah. Then he'd go back. He'd come back. And I go, what about that jacket with this bow tie? And literally, I'm not kidding. I, he's sitting right here. I'm not making this up. Right, Rod? Sure, that's no. what happened. Yeah, he, yeah. Rod, Rod went back. See, yeah, that's it. We've got it. And this is what we all sometimes don't pay attention to. You didn't pay $23 million for a movie. But guess what? You still have a director. A lot of us go out there and think, well, you know, we don't know what we do. No, you don't. I have two directors. One is my buddy, Mark Williams, who does all the editing uh, in Vegas. And the other one is my son. And my son is uh, Keith Churcher, who's here, bless his heart. He, he, he's met my son and seen him perform. Um, and my son will look at me and go, eh, my dad. I, I, and I, Anthony, since you brought up Mark's name in Vegas, the editing on that show that Rod was on with the technical glitches, if you go back and watch that show, you'll never see those glitches. Oh, he, no, he, Mark he is that good. Yeah, Mark is not only a brilliant editor, he's actually a magician. And anybody who's anybody in Vegas knows him. He's not like up there in the like, like You go talk to, you know, Penn Gillette or Lance is not there anymore. He's down to Kentucky. Or anybody like that come on. They go, oh, yeah. You know, because Mark's there with him. He's, he's like, he's a very kind of low key, great, great guy. And it's this giving. I don't know if you know, but if you're taking an hour or a two hour show, I'll watch it after Joel sends me the recording. I'll sit at the mark. He'll sit there and work on it for days and days. And you know what? Nobody gets paid a penny. That's the giving. That's the giving. And that, that's what it's all about. And God, it's going to sound like a cliche. Yeah, ever, well, since, you, Anthony, ever, ever since I was yay high. Anthony, yeah. I was yeah. taught in my family. It comes back to you, man. If it doesn't come back to you, it comes back to your children or your children's children. It comes back. Always comes back. Certainly, Anthony, Always. I have to give you credit for that because it made a huge difference. And uh, and, and you being AIMC, you knew what the, uh, the, the, the judges were looking for. And you really put tightened up the act and put it to the form that I felt proud of. Of, of performing it actually that 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 day, yeah. and I've kept the yeah. changes that you've actually put into the act. So really appreciate that. And no, no, totally. and, and and Brett's and Mark's help before that, yeah. Uh, yeah, Brett was there and Mark's there too. So th th their help as well, their input also. Uh, Joe, Joel has put uh, up in the chat. He's put up. If you go up the chat, Joel, Joel um, has put the link to the SAM showcase. 
okay? And on the showcase, there are very all the Darkstone dossiers with Jeff McBride, Kevin James, uh, you know, super names, uh, Sean Farquhar. These guys have been, you know, they're all buddies. I know them. I just ask them to come on a show and, you know, we then plan it and work out what we're going to do and everything. We don't just switch on a camera and talk. <laughs> and if you're, <laughs> Anthony, if you're asking Joel to post something, he's actually left the room. He had to go. Yeah, I know. I, I know this. He's got to run and I know where he's going to okay. run to, too. Yeah. Okay. okay. Oh, I guess we've got about 10 more minutes left. Of the open, yeah, open that's house it. Here. And we got to, then we got to, then we got to wrap. Um, but you know what? If ever anybody, that's left here wants to get back particularly like kip and just have a sit down you know pull yourself a drink chit chat like we're doing now you know i'm open i'm sure rod is i'm sure michael is i'm sure paul abby is you know anybody that just wants to get together man you know we, we could put up a little thing and just shoot the breeze to use an old expression yeah and then just chit chat as one gentleman has not said a word my lovely 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 wonderful friend keith churcher who um, you know, he's just, just, just an amazing guy. I tell you, his life is just unbelievable. I told you before, and I'll tell you again before we go. The Magic Circle Theater was full when they did a uh, tribute honor to him and all the people that Keith just gave and gave and gave to when he was running uh, things for young magicians. And then when uh, uh, then it, the Magic Circle so they took it over, uh, became the young magician or some such thing. But anyway, they took it over. But for years but, and years... But you had Mark Paul on, didn't you? Mark, indeed, I had Mark Paul yeah. as a guest here, and Mark was one of your, one of your guys. He was, but, but, but he only ever came second. He only ever came second, yes. Um, well, my, my son was as well. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Uh, he, he, he got the trophy, the John Hart trophy. Um, I don't know, it was just absolute kindness and giving... Um, and there are names only perhaps one or two folks here from England would know, like Paul. Uh, you know, there was um, oh, Bob Hayden, uh, Ian Adair, um, you know, great people. That were there. Bobby Burnett, Bobby Bernard, uh, Alan Les, Jackson, uh, Brian Alan Miller. Jackson, all these guys. Yeah. They, they, you know, all the big names. They, every one of them came and gave, you know, years later, I ran into Bobby. And I think he was not very well. He was actually in a wheelchair at the time. And the first thing he said to me was not, hello, how are you? He turns to me and he goes, how's that wonderful son of yours? I mean, wow. You know? <laughs> and if you knew this gentleman, may his memory be a blessing. If you knew this gentleman, he didn't mince words. And let's just say uh, he could teach a, a sailor a few choice phrases. Shall we say that? <laughs> Correct, Keith? Yeah. B Bobby could swear like a sailor and a trooper at the same time. Uh, yeah. but, you know, he, he, he knew stuff. And he just went, I remember him coming up to Charles and he went, that's good. That's a Las Vegas act. And you know what? In two years' time, he opened for Steve Dacry at the Orleans. You know, so it, it, this is the giving, the giving. It's, it's what it's all about. I, I can't emphasize it enough. I mean, I don't know if you want to emphasize it, Paul, Paul or Michael, but, yeah, leave it to you guys. It's putting it back in the kitty, isn't it, for the future generation? Yes. Yes. It, it absolutely, is, absolutely is. Absolutely is. Oh, yeah. Bobby never missed his words, that's for sure. No, no, sir. No, sir. No. And he knew a lot of choice Anglo-Saxon words, too, shall we say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, you know, you learned a lot. You learned a lot from, you know, great guys like that. Well, I think we're probably, if nobody's got any questions for Michael or anything they want to address, uh, you know, I think we maybe want to wrap this up a little bit. Um, so, Anthony, when, when, when's your next uh, show and who's going to be on it? Do you know yet? Oh, thank you, Brett. Yes, I do know. Um, on the 27th of February, same time, on the Darkstone Dossiers, we have Suzanne the Magician. And if you head over tomorrow to, um, I've had long, long chats with her. My God, what an amazing lady. You wouldn't believe. Wait till you hear some of the things she's going to tell you on the show. Inspirational. Uh, she's on tomorrow as a guest with, I think I mentioned already, Greg Wilson, etc. cetera. Um, at the HAOM register. Right. Trust me, you won't you won't you won't go wrong. Just see great people there like Gene Proder, Scott Well. I mean just unbelievably great people. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, again, very, very giving. Very, very giving. I mean I have stories like Gene the friggin' storm was coming in, a hurricane or whatever. And Gene said, okay, we're gonna get you in a car. He drove me up. It's like being a spy movie. He took me to some place in the parking lot, PJs with another car. They throw all my stuff in it to get me up to Houston because I had to do a talk show with Walter Blaney. Yeah, you know, this is the caring. 
this is the curry. And then everything went by, and Gene and his wife, Betty Droyle, we come up, they come to the, um, yeah, the TAOM, and then he drives me back and, you know, says, hey, hang out with us. So, you know, I become his house guest. This is it's just, this is what it's about, I think. And I kind of feel sad for some of the younger guys who don't get this, you know, they don't get it. It's like, look at me on YouTube. Here I am in my kitchen with my T-shirt and, you know, jeans torn at the knees. And I'm just being clever. And, you know, it's not magic. It, it, you're not entertaining anybody. Sorry. It works for David Blaine. Because <laughs> Bill, Bill Kalu sat with David Blaine and they worked out the character before he even went on Conan O'Brien's show and did the ambitious card. You know, <laughs> this is what people don't get. Uh, but hey, you know, I'm not here to preach, man. I, you know, I don't know everything. Okay. Oh, well, what do you reckon? Uh, leave the last word, I think, to anybody else who wants it, because I think we got to pretty much shut everything down. I love these um, sessions. You know, I love yeah. these sessions. Thanks for showing up, Christopher. It's great. Did you enjoy it? Did you enjoy it? I'm sorry I've had to turn my camera off for most. Oh, of that's it. all right. Not a problem. Not a problem. Not a problem. Process, but yeah, you and you and I. I'm glad you liked it. Thank you for thank you for coming. Uh, no, we'll, have, we'll have a chat. We we'll bring you in. We we'll bring you into the SVM and all the other yeah. guys. Magic room as well. Yeah, yeah. lovely. Yeah. Great yeah. evening. Thank yeah. you, Dr. Michael. Yeah, right. thank, thank thank you, Dr. Michael, for coming everybody. in. Great lecture. Thank great you. great uh, chat. Thank you so much. So, what are you going to do, Brett? You're going to take this and keep the recording and everything else? Because I, I will, I will shut it. this thing down here in just a second. Yes, sir. Uh, okay, you're the co-host, so you do your things. Well, great to see everybody, and thank you so much again for everything and all your kind words. And thank you so much, Michael. Much appreciated. Thank oh, you. very, very quickly, very, very quickly. I must, I must do this. Yeah, old age, man. You know, senior moment. Yeah, Suzanne, twenty seventh, and I believe it's the thirteenth, but I'll post it is one of the legendary card men of the time. People in England will know him. Lots of people will know him. Paul Gordon, he's going to be my guest. Right, right. Yeah, Keith, Keith's just gone right. Right, okay. Paul Gordon's going to be my uh, Doc Stone's guest in the first, uh, whatever the date is. I, I, I don't have it to hand, but it's, I'll post it. It's, it's in March. It's Bring in March. a pack of cards with it. Don't miss mm -hmm. that. It's going to be red hot. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I only hey, bring folks. you the best, guys. I only bring you the best. Please go to the uh, showcase link that Joel put up, most illustrious uh, informer uh, put up, and have a look. There's a lot of stuff in there, and when you get a chance, um, you know, have a look at the Anthony Darkstone Magic Chronicles and other things. Uh, Tim Wise, who is our first VP on the SAM International Assembly uh, is also the CEO and head honcho of Abra.tv. And if you go there, on Channel 20, it's the SAM. Uh, channel 14 is some guy I never heard of. You'll figure out who he is. Um, and then you've also got BJW Jewelry, which is Harriet and Gay Blackstone and Robbie Wilmot, who's Phil Wilmot's wife. Yeah. There's Harriet doing like that. Uh, met, I, I met Harriet years and years ago. I can't remember where, which convention. And you had all these lovely bits of jewelry, which I love. Anyway, uh, so it's Harriet and Harriet's BJW uh, company with uh, Robbie, Milmart, uh, Robbie Wilmot, uh, Gay Blackstone, and Harriet. They also sponsor Abra News. It's all been posted. Go and take a look. It did not cost you a dime. Go and have a look. Hey, Go folks, ahead. I think that's our time. Let's wrap it up again. Yes, sir. Anthony, thank you. Dr. Michael. Thank Lance, you, thank Brett. You, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it. Everyone, that. thank you for attending, and uh, we'll see you on the next one. Good night. Thanks. Have a great Sunday. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.